currently the most promising treatments are the Janus kinase inhibitors. They are tofacitinib and ruxolitinib. The, those are the current oral therapies that are available. I think they would be very helpful for all patients with alopecia areata, but really given their side effect profile and risks involved, um, the, they should be reserved for more extensive disease uh, and trials and studies that have been published. Most of those patients have at least 30% of their scalp hair loss involved, lost, um, and many more extensive than that. In terms of treatment algorithms, uh, usually it's based on the extent of hair loss. Um, 25 to 50% or less um, localized disease is usually intralesional trimcinolone injections, sometimes topical immunotherapy, um, depending on the patient's preferences. And then anything more extensive than that or patients who are rapidly losing their hair um, and appear to be progressing very quickly, usually that's the over the course of weeks to months, um, then I would consider more of a systemic treatment. Um, prednisone or systemic steroids are still a mainstay of, uh, for that first line. Um, but uh, quickly, when you go over, because other treatments don't have consistent efficacy and they have, um, some tend to be expensive, like the Janus kinase inhibitors, um, there's a lot of patient choice involved in what is decided to do next. Um, the other traditional immunosuppressants like methotrexate, cyclosporin, those all can be helpful um, and there are some publications that suggest that they're helpful, um, but there's, it's just all about their side effect profile and patient, to, patient decisions. So at that point, um, if they have tried some of those or even if they have not tried any of those, I may try Janus kinase inhibitors or suggest them to the patient. Um, if they at that time, I mentioned in my talk that I do refer patients to rheumatologists at UCLA and in our institution as well because some of them do have samples uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, but they um, do provide them to some of the patients with alopecia areata. Otherwise, insurance coverage tends to be very tricky. Some people have had success. Um, I have personally had a few cases of success for insurance coverage. Um, and. Uh, in those cases, it's great. You know, patients don't have to worry about the cost. Um, other uh, physicians have mentioned patients will sometimes get their medications out of the country as less expensive. And then there's also a patient assistance program through the pharmaceutical company that provides at least tofacitinib. You can't change the code. The code is alopecia areata. If they have a coexistent rheumatologic condition, perhaps they can get coverage in one patient who was successful that way. Um, and then letters, letters of appeal. I think this is where photographs can be very helpful. Um, patients can advocate on their, uh, on their own behalf. Sometimes we get success that way. Um, and try, just keep trying, because sometimes the second time, third time, you actually do get some success. So in terms of associations, I would say that alopecia areata is known to be associated with thyroid disease and uh, there's a significantly increased number of people who have both. Um, treating, so screening for thyroid disease is reasonable. Um, treating patients w for their thyroid disease does not usually bring their hair back when it's alopecia areata. Um, the other things like vitamin D, uh, ferritin is sometimes screened for in hair loss in general, uh, looking for anemia, and um, vitamin D deficiency. Again, there's no proof that improving those, supplementing those actually helps. Um, so while they can be checked, I can't recommend that they are routinely checked.